Hello, my friends. Welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm your host, Joanna LaFleur, and you're watching the YouTube version of the podcast. Week after week, we're coming at you with conversations with creatives and communicators all about how to communicate the best news in the world but in the digital age. Thanks so much for watching, checking out this episode. If you want to know more, you want to check out more of our free resources, go to wordmadedigital.com or browse around this YouTube channel and you're definitely going to find some content that will help you. And of course, thank you so much to our sponsors, Compassion Canada and Wycliffe College are making this podcast possible. Enjoy the interview. Harris the Third, welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm so glad to have you today. Thank you. Excited to be here. I have never interviewed a magician or an illusionist of any kind, but whenever I hear the word, I think of Arrested Development with Joe <laughs> trying to be respected for his art. Yes. <laughs> what about you? Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> um, you know, magic's changed quite a bit over the last 10 to 15 years. I certainly did when I was a teenager. Magic wasn't cool back in the 90s. Uh, uh -huh. So any, anytime you met someone on an airplane or somewhere, you're like, oh, you're a magician. Like at birthday parties, do you Yeah, well, and it was, um, you're right, like a, maybe a bit corny, um, like the, maybe some of the illusions that, you know, we all know, like when you saw the woman in half, everybody mm -hmm. knows how that trick works now. Uh, so the magic has been lost of how that goes. Um, yeah, or at least they think they know how it works. It feels like we're yeah, magicians yeah, are constantly reinventing themselves and coming up with new ways to do things. It could just be that maybe I'm growing up and getting more secure myself so it's like the less insecure oh, I I am, the less need i feel to be like oh no it's not like rabbits out of hats it's kind of cool it's like this instead <laughs> but i would love to know how they pull a rabbit out of a hat i mean that's always the thing people probably are people asking all the time the how do you do it do you ever reveal yeah of course yeah it's, it's a good <laughs> it's a good chunk of what i wrote about in my book the wonder switch was just kind of about this sort of psychological reconditioning that has taken place you know like a hundred years ago, if you would have seen a magician in a real theater in the early 1900s pull a rabbit out of a hat, which is something you would have seen a magician do a hundred years ago, you would have gone, man, I want to know how he does that. You would have the same feeling. However, you would have been fine not knowing because you had to be comfortable with mystery in the early 1900s, right? Mm -hmm. We weren't in the information age. You didn't have a device in your pocket that could give you the secret to how anything works. And as a result, that tension that we now feel is so much stronger. It's like, no, I have to understand. And we've been conditioned to believe that we can understand because it's the information age and there's got to be a YouTube video that can explain how something works. So we've kind of become uncomfortable with wonder. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. We've become uncomfortable with wonder. Um, I'd like to pull at that a little bit, but okay, before we go, we probably have jumped ahead. I've jumped right in <laughs> as if we've been, you know, as if we're all old friends, but let's, let's tell people a little bit. Who are you, Harris the Third? Can you give us a little bit of an introduction? And then I want to go back to this wonder conversation later. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I spent 20 years of my life traveling around the world doing magic shows. You know, my ability to make other people wonder by way of performing illusions uh, is what took me around the world. I started when I was young as a little kid. By the time I was 21, I made a million dollars doing those magic shows. Uh, escaped my little small town, moved to the big city, bought the American dream, and by 22 was bankrupt. Everything came crashing down, and that sort of sent me off on a journey to try to figure out what life is all about. And honestly, really how in the world I got tricked into making all those bad choices. And what yeah. I discovered was the power that stories and narrative plays in our lives and how it drives our thinking and decisions. And so that was a deep rabbit hole I went down. And so now I've shifted most of my career to uh, storytelling. And I like to say, as I said before our call, I'm, I'm less of a magician these days and more of a storyteller who happens to do magic tricks. But once you understand um, that narrative, you know, it is powerful. It's powerful to transform our communication. It changes the way we lead and it changes our lives and how we live. Now, we got to pause there because you said you made a million bucks by 21 and then you kind of lost it all. 
<laughs> you know, within, you know, whatever, a few years later, uh, in brief, was that like you were a kid and didn't know anything about money or like, how did, how did that happen? <laughs> Basically? Yeah. You know, I grew up in a small town. My parents had a minimum wage jobs. We were pretty poor by American standards. And so I remember being about 15 years old and my parents sitting me down and explaining that I'd made six figures that year, more money than they had ever made in two years combined. Um, and wow. I didn't know what to do with money like that. And so I was just eager to travel the world and get rich and famous and leave my little small town and move to the big city. Um, and so ended up building a house in a wealthy suburb in Nashville, which was not a huge city, but it was big to me at the time. And it's getting bigger. Um, and filled my house up with cool stuff and bought two expensive cars and wore expensive jeans and hang out with the right celebrities in the right parts of town. You know, when you're reaching for the illusion of more, and your value mm -hmm. as a human being and your identity is wrapped up in the perceptions of other people because you're so insecure and desperate to feel loved and accepted, then you're, you continue to reach for the illusion of more and it's never enough. Um, and I like to say some people are so poor, all they have is money. And that was me. Yeah. And so I spent all my money and then some, and all I had left over at the end of it all was a few hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. Um, and so lies and deception are powerful. Uh, and I discovered in that process that, you know, the principles of deception that make it possible to get someone to believe a lie are the same principles that I was using on stage in a magic show. Those principles were pretty uh -huh. universal. So when I took a step back and said, how did this happen? I had this huge epiphany. I was like, wow, I was tricked into believing all these lies, which led to this situation using the same principles I used to pull a rabbit out of a hat or cut a lady in half and put her back together again. Wow. I mean, so I'm not so familiar with, I'm familiar with creatives and performers and storytellers, but less with this niche of magician. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're, you're, it's interesting. I love this. And you're doing this mirror of the illusion of wealth, success, power, popularity, and then, and then illusions on stage. Would you say that's a, is that a thing in your <laughs> uh, no. Like when you look at like, is that, you know, watch out kids. If you become a magician, your life will be a lie. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there certainly is that. It's interesting that anytime Hollywood writes a script about a magician, it often has that sort of subtext in the script. Uh, you know, the prestige, the illusion. These are all people who are trying to figure out who they are. Um, mm -hmm. and other people, you know, hiding from other people who the truth about who they really are. And some of that comes with you know, magicians are sort of sworn to secrecy. We place a very high value on secrecy and we're really good at keeping secrets. And so if we have an experience in our own lives, instead of living openly and vulnerably in community with other people, we have a tendency to sort of hide and bury all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so our struggles never come out in the open instead of opening up and talking to other people about parts of our story that aren't so, uh, parts that we're proud of, I guess I should say. Mm. Uh, it's easy just to bury it and keep it a secret and no one will ever find out about it because we're so good at that. So I think it's less that we're living a lie and more that we are not always great at showing people who we really are. And maybe that's a lie of omission of the truth, I suppose. Um, but there's this certainly, there's certainly this sort of thread in the magic industry of our vocation as illusionists becoming our lifestyles. It's like the mm. line between illusion and reality gets blurred and we never know when the show has come to an end. And so we perform a magic show and then we walk off stage, but it's like we never really stop performing. And I don't think that's wow. exclusive to just magic. I think that's entertainment industry in general because the applause. Well, and it's, yes, <laughs> anyone on stage of any kind, right? There's the stage you, and then, you know, how many, I think of like Christian bands where you, when you peel back the layer, you know, a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes, you know, by, by a few years in the guys in the band don't believe any of the words they're singing, but they make money doing it. So they're trapped in it or the preacher yeah. who's got, you know, women on the side, but it's talking about Jesus and sin, you know, like all this, <laughs> you know, it's a mess. Yeah, I, it's I mean, it's not, I don't think you're right. That's not unique to magicians for sure. But, but, um, you know, one of the questions I wanted to poke at, bef uh, with you, which maybe kind of bridges out of this is, um, there are, I don't come from this tradition myself, but there are many people of Christian traditions, faith traditions that like magic is bad. 
magic yeah. is a bad word or like, you know, I think the classic thing is you can't watch Harry Potter because it's witches <laughs> and wizards. Um, I, that's not my own uh, Christian culture, but, but uh, I'm sure you've come up against this. So I, I'm curious to know uh, what has that been sort of Christians and magic? What has the sure. response been? Why do you think they're wary of it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think all humans, uh, tend to fear what they don't understand, and especially religious people who hold any sort of religious worldview. If we don't understand how something works and it seems mysterious to us, instead of thinking that mysteries are beautiful, which again, that's that is sort of where humanity used to be. There used to be a much higher value placed on the mysterious. But now we need everything explained to us. And it's interesting because when we see a magic trick, if we don't know the secret, we start making assumptions about what it is and we go, well, it must be satanic or it must be demonic. And yet we don't look at our cell phone and think, well, I can't explain how this little device beams my voice through the air to another country on the planet in real time so that <laughs> person can hear me. Like you can't explain to me how our smart, maybe you can, maybe you're like this secret. No, I mean, <laughs> vaguely, yeah, but not specifically. But none of us look at our <laughs> smartphones and be like, oh no, it's satanic, right? It's certainly how these things are used. And so magic has gotten a bad rap. It's actually why I've most often been known as an illusionist to a lot of circles instead of a magician. It's not that there's really a difference to magicians. It just feels like a safer word so that people don't misunderstand what it is. But look, magic tricks are really hard. If I had some sort of special magical power, I wouldn't spend my time pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Uh, like I'd be making money up here, right? Or I'd be levitating <laughs> or I'd be sitting on an island somewhere making everything that I need appear right next to me while I'm laying out on the beach in the sun. Like we wouldn't yeah. use our powers for the things that we use them for. It's pretty hilarious if you think about it that way. And so because it's really hard, you know, I don't have a problem making it clear that it's just a trick because those who believe that there's a devil and that Satan is real, I don't want him to get credit for my hard work, right? Because most of the stuff I do is pretty complicated. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a little silly, but I certainly understand it. It just comes back to that idea. Again, we fear what we don't understand. Magic is based on an element of mystery. We no longer value or place, uh, you know, hold mis the mysterious in this high esteem anymore. Um, uh, and that's pretty heartbreaking, but it also leads to us being scared of things that are mysterious to us. Mm. And that's interesting the way you talk about it as a past tense, um, you know, I, I, my understanding is you've done much more work into this than I have, but there was a time you think where people were let, were more willing to sit with the mysterious or the wonder or the, I don't know. They had to, right? I mean, if you experience something mysterious, uh, and you're living in a cave and you watch something <laughs> like, okay, you know, okay. You know, Armstrong was right, Neil Armstrong, when he said that, you know, when we experience that moment of wonder, it drives us to seek to understand. It makes us really curious. So it's we might see something that's mysterious to us and go, oh, wow, that's amazing. I want to understand. But there was no library to go to. There was no phone, smartphone to pull out of your pocket. You couldn't see something amazing and then just pull out your phone and Google it and watch a YouTube video that explains it to you in 30 seconds. So, I mean, it should come as no surprise that there's an entire generation now that has a hard time believing in a divine being that is incredibly mysterious and will always remain completely mysterious based on our inability to comprehend that divine being with our human minds. No wonder we can't have faith in something like that because we've lost our ability to wonder because that mysteriousness mm -hmm. feels so uncomfortable. So I think that's new. I think not just the information age, but that information being carried around in our pockets with instantaneous mm -hmm. access I think that has psychologically reconditioned us to live as if, I don't know, it's like we're living under the illusion of the abundance of certainty. And with the presence of that abundance of certainty comes, you know, a really, really, really strong discomfort with a wonder. Mm. Yeah, I think it's it's fair what you're saying. I I think there's always been a desire in humans to make meaning. I mean, we've, you know, the stories around the campfire, you sure. know, a few thousand years ago, there was always stories of where we came from or how it all worked. Uh, of course, now we don't think those stories are true. <laughs> so, you know, but, I don't know, <laughs> yeah. like, like thunder and lightning. We have a scientific explanation now for thunder and lightning. We've lost maybe. So you keep using this word wonder. So what is wonder? Uh, 
Uh, can you define what is wonder? Why do we need this wonder that we're talking sure. about? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to. I want, can I say one more thing about what you just said? Sure, of course. You know, it has a lot to do with the value of the process, right? Like, you know, the fact that we are meaning-making creatures, that we tell stories to make sense of the world around us. Uh, I think it's okay to be curious and to go explore and try to solve those mysteries. Uh, but it's interesting that, you know, what neuroscientists have discovered is that all of the chemicals that are active in our brain that are most associated with creativity, those are present when we are curious, um, but they're present with a type of curiosity that is connected to an exploration of the unknown without a predetermined destination or, you know, a specific answer that we're looking for. It's just a willingness to go explore and see where we end up. A lot of times mm -hmm. we have this faux sense of curiosity, like, how did you pull that rabbit out of the hat? I don't know why I keep using that as an example. It's the trick we first talked about. I but... still don't know how. So, so you you watch know, a magician it's fine. I'm still going to wonder hat. about it. Yeah. When you go up to the magician, you say, hey, how did you do that? And they say, well, I can't tell you. It's a secret. But I need to know. I just want to know how did you pull the rabbit out of the hat? And then we think, well, that's just curious. That happened to me one time, right? I did this illusion where I made a table levitate. And this kid came up to me afterwards. It was at a school assembly. And I had given this talk on the value of wonder and curiosity. And I said, well, did you hear the part of the talk where I said, you need to value the role that wonder plays in your life and your perspective? And he goes, yeah, but you also talked a lot about curiosity. And I'm just curious, how did you make that table levitate? <laughs> and he thought, ha, I got you, right? The problem is, is he wasn't actually curious. He just wanted the answer to a question. And so genuine curiosity is less about, hey, will you just give me the answer? That's like sort of taking, it's like allowing Google to take the quest out of the question. And so I think what you're talking about is probably when we're willing to go explore and find, and that's when we most learn, as opposed to, hey, can you just tell me the answer so I don't have to search for it? Because that's not genuine curiosity. So how do we do that? How do we you know, find ourselves in a state of wonder? How do we create wonder? How do we find wonder? And so the answer to that question that you asked is, I would define wonder as a state that we can reawaken or get back to. And I would define it simply as wonder is what gives us permission to believe in a story that we have yet to see. So on that same subject, if we are meaning-making creatures, I, I think that we are storytelling beings, that how we were created and wired is to think in narrative. So like my phone that I keep talking about runs off of an operating system called iOS. My parents have a computer that runs off of an operating system called Windows. Your brain and my brain are wired to run off of an operating system called narrative. So we think in narrative. We walk around all day long telling ourselves stories to make sense of the world. And we do this so often that even when we go to bed at night, we physically sleep, but our brain stays up all night long telling ourselves more stories, which means that all change in our life and the life of the culture around us, all transformation and change could be oversimplified by simply moving from an old story to a new story. Because the narrative that we adopt as true is what drives all human behavior, our choices, our thinking, our worldview. And so wonder is this sort of necessary component that has to be present to open us up to the possibility of a new story. And it beckons us and invites us to step into and explore the possibility of the truth that can be found in that new story. Huh. And what I'm hearing you say too, uh, sort of subtly where you, the example of the kid who you said he wasn't actually curious, he just wanted an answer. It, what I'm struck by in what you're describing is it it's work. Yeah. Uh, it's not for the wonder is not for the lazy. <laughs> no, not at all. I think it's hard to be lazy and in wonder, you know, uh, I think wonder drives action. Uh, that's what curiosity is. Curiosity is wonder in action. So if wonder mm -hmm. is a state, if it's sort of a noun that you can be in, you know, when that noun becomes a verb, it turns into curiosity. So there's a lot of people who view wonder as this sort of non-essential, sure, it'd be nice if I had it sort of childlike thing. Oh, but curiosity, like, oh, hasn't that been linked to like creativity and innovation? And, you know, people who are curious are more successful. I'm like, yes, but that curiosity is simply wonder in action. So you can't have a live a curious life or do curious work without reawakening your sense of childlike wonder. Hmm. Yeah, it's this idea, um, the childlikeness, but um, I think for some people, the, the uncomfortable places where it feels childish, not childlike, uh, like immature. It feels immature to totally. be this. 
Totally. Um, so what would you say to that? You know, like, what would your response be? Yeah. Is it talk, immature <laughs> talk a or lot is it naive? That. Yeah. I mean, you see yeah. this in scripture, right? Like later in the New Testament, uh, you know, Paul talks about how we have to grow up, grow wise, put away childish things. So he's saying, don't be childish. But then when Jesus was on the scene, you know, and all the this story with the disciples that are like, Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know, Jesus basically goes and gets a kid. I would imagine he brings this kid into this middle of the circle where he's teaching the disciples and he points to the kid and he not only answers their question by saying this kid is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He takes it a step further and says, in fact, unless you even have the mind of a child, you will never even enter the kingdom of God. In other words, how can those things both be true? Are we are we supposed to put away childishness or are we supposed to be childlike? And I think there's a difference. We can grow up and grow in wisdom and put away childish things without ever losing our childlike faith, our childlike awe, our childlike wonder that permits us to believe in the mysterious magic that is in and through everything, including ourselves. And without that wonder present, it's hard to believe in those things that we have yet to see, which is why I define wonder as what gives us permission to believe in what we have yet to see. The reason I think it feels immature is because of cynicism. Cynicism sort of whispers in our ear and lies to us and says, hey, don't act like that. You're acting like a child right now. You're going to look like a fool. But cynicism mm -hmm. is a liar, and it keeps you trapped in this mindset that that seeing is believing. You know, if there's anything that being a magician has taught me is that what we see is not always what you get, that human beings are actually not that great at figuring out what the truth is or labeling reality based on what our senses perceive. Like I can use the psychological principles of deception to trick you into telling yourself a story that isn't true based purely on what your eyes see or what your ears hear, which means that seeing is not always believing. But what the science backs up, every time the neuroscience is partnered with magicians to understand how the human brain interprets information based on what our five senses perceive, what they confirm every single time is that seeing is not believing, but that believing is seeing. That often what we believe actually paints and changes what we see. Now, I don't mean that in like a sort of new age, woo-woo, like, oh, if you just believe in it, you can manifest it. It's not like the secret or the law of attraction. It's that sometimes something exists right in front of our face. It's just we can't see it because we don't believe that it's there. Roald Dahl famously said, those who don't believe in magic will never find it, which means there's magic mm -hmm. all around us. We just can't see it unless we believe in it first. So it's almost like the belief permits us to be able to see it. And you, you've you probably experienced this. If you ever had a friend or a family member and you're just like, why can't she see the truth? It is right there in front of her face. And everyone around <laughs> this person can see the truth, but they can't. Well, it's not that that truth doesn't yeah. exist. That person doesn't believe it because they've traded the truth for a lie which permits mm -hmm. you to see things through a different perspective. And the same is true with problem solving, right? Like sometimes the solution doesn't exist yet, but if you sit around and think, oh, there's, there's just, there's no hope. This isn't going to work. Like we're never going to find a solution to this problem. That's living as if seeing is believing. And that's actually the way, that's how we're actually childish, right? That's how we behave when we're little kids sometimes. Uh, but the childlike part of a healthy childhood says, okay, we don't see a solution yet, but that doesn't mean one doesn't exist. And the belief that one could, that potential, opens up your wonder and gives you the ability to go explore and find that solution. So seeing is a believing, but believing is seeing. Seeing is believing, yeah. that mindset, I would associate with childishness. Childlikeness says, what I see is not always what we get, but what I believe has the power to change what I see. And so I'm gonna believe and then see. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, in a faith, I mean, it's all so many parallels to a journey of faith or end doubt. Uh, you know, we all go through, you know, is this God stuff? Is God real? Is, you know, is Jesus who he said he was? You know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. And you go through these, well, what have I seen and what do I believe? And how does one inform the other? You know, am I just part of this big 
sometimes, you know, I, you know, I think of one of the things that is a place of wonder for me, it's not for everyone would be in a large, we can't do them these days, these large gatherings of mm. church people where, mm. uh, you, there's something for me very powerful about a large group of people singing together, you know, united for a few minutes in sure. the same focus. Uh, to me, that feels like wonder, but then you step away from it and you say, well, was that God or was that just, you know, a bunch of people in a room feeling good, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, like, like the believing and seeing, um, are interplaying and, and, um, yeah, yeah notice, it messes with your faith. Yeah. But notice even now that you're curious about it, right? Like that's curiosity is that you question mm. things and yeah. wondering things and trying to figure it out. And this is just my personal opinion, but I think God's not stressed out about your curiosity. Um, yes. I think he's completely comfortable with your questions. Uh, and I think if we're genuinely curious, not faux curious, but if we're genuinely curious, uh, I think we're going to find what it is that we're meant to find because it's your soul has that DNA in it. It's what you were created to crave and search for. And there's only one thing that can fill that void. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's yeah. uh, curiosity and the embracing of the mystery, even during the times that our curiosity can't figure out the answer to all the questions. It's completely healthy, and it's just a part of our spiritual journey. Um, you talk in your book about the uh, that we're suffering from a wonder deficiency. I mm. love that phrase, a wonder deficiency, like, you know, like we're having a vitamin D deficiency <laughs> or no whatever. Doubt. I love that. Um, so what do you do in your life, uh, to combat that? How does that, how does that work? Sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it, I get asked all the time, where do I find wonder if I lost it? Uh, and, and living in a place of wonder, getting back to a place of wonder, turning on the wonder switch as you know, the title of the book uses the analogy mm -hmm. of to turn on the wonder switch, you know, you have to understand that you came into this world wide awake to wonder. And so wonder is your natural state. It's how you were designed to live, which means that to find wonder again is less about you going and finding something that you don't have and more about you getting a blockage out of the way so that you can return back to your true self. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's less about finding something and more about identifying the lie that is getting in the way of the truth. Huh. And sometimes that has oh, to do with... Yeah, going back and exploring our trauma, we have to figure out where the untrue story came from. You know, trauma is stored in the lower third limbic system, part of our brains. That's the part where a lot of active storytelling comes from. And so trauma is often quite literally your brain's inability to make sense of the story that you're in, right? It goes back to the fact that we're uh -huh. storytelling creatures and that we think in narratives. So if the narrative that we adopt as true says, okay, Adults treat me this way. Kids on the playground treat me this way. Everything is awesome. Life is great. I always get food when I need it. Well, all of a sudden, a part of our story comes along and breaks that narrative. Well, all of a sudden, our brain can't compute, and it results in trauma. It's like I can't make sense of that part of the story because I thought adults were supposed to treat me this way. I thought food was always available, and now it's not. So whatever that trauma is, it gives birth to many times shame, addiction, when that narrative gets broken, it gives birth to a bunch of lies. We get tricked into believing a whole bunch of stuff that isn't true. And to make sense and survive, we repeat those untrue stories back to us. And those untrue stories lead us to spiraling out of control and the wonder switch gets turned off. It's like wonder gets snuffed out. And so mm -hmm. to find your way back to wonder is about peeling back all those layers. It's about identifying all those lies. It's about radical self-inquiry and healing from trauma and exploring all those untrue stories and then sort of correcting them. That's why I finished the book on uh, something I call write, story writing, uh, and it's not a typo. It's spelled R-I-G-H-T. So we have to literally correct. We have to write our story uh, and get that new story aligned with the story that we want to live uh, so we can live the life that we're created to live. And that requires turning the wonder switch back on. Uh, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's it's uh, this wonder thing in many ways is tying to sort of the science and psychology of our health. Um, no I mean, you talk about you talk about also this idea of um, studies that talk about we are healthiest, like our mind, our body is at its best if we're having mm. regular experiences that you describe as admiration, amazement, and awe. Yeah. Admiration, amazement, and awe. 
And I think for all of us, that's probably coming from different places. Are you familiar with Sacred Pathways, that book, Gary, I think uh, Gary Chapman, Sacred Pathways? Oh, uh, yeah. I've not read it, Just but like, I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that uh, there are these sacred pathways, you know, through our brain or through serving others or through being in nature, you know, there's aesthetic mm-hmm. things, you know, these different places that are sacred, are pathways to connect with God. And we all have different ones. Um, but that's what that's what um, reminded me this idea of like we need these experiences that fill us with admiration, amazement, and awe. But it's yeah. not going to look the same for everybody. Yeah, um, the pathway to it's different. Yeah, it does. And b- again, because we have to correct those untrue stories, right? And so all of our narratives got broken by different experiences. They're not all the same, but there are common threads throughout them all, which is what I try to cover in the book. So regardless of what your story is, you know, you can find your way back home, so to speak, or get back to your truest, authentic self. Um, but you're right. Our bodies are wired for wonder. It's almost as if God created us to live in wonder. There's a lot of new studies out now. UC Berkeley is doing a lot of research around positive awe states. They've even noticed a link between being in awe and chronic inflammation in your body, which shows that to live wow. a life awake in wonder means it can decrease inflammation in your body, even boost your immune system, decrease stress. Uh, there's a study linking a presence of awe with a sense of smallness, not in a negative sense of low self-esteem, but an awareness that you are a small part of a much bigger whole, which can increase our empathy and change our ability to connect with other human beings on an emotional level. I mean... The presence of awe and wonder quite literally shifts the physiology in your bodies. And it just kind of shows just how wired and created we are for this stuff. I'm like, I'm literally, as you're saying this, I'm feeling the awe and wonder of like, <laughs> like, uh, how that is so deeply connected, like, uh, like inflammation in our body and awe and wonder. Uh, yeah. Man, it opens this us is fascinating. up. Fascinating. Well, yeah, and think about I'm this. I'm fascinated by this. Yeah, and think about this in the context of your work around even just the subject of communication. You know, as communicators, what does this mean for the role that our communication plays in awakening the wonder of others? That if you want to introduce someone to the hope of a new story, if you're trying to introduce a truth to someone they currently do not believe because they can't see it, wonder is required to open them up, to get them open to that truth. Wonder is required to give them the belief that they need to step into the possibility of that new truth or that new story, which means I think we have to have, we as communicators have to have a serious conversation about how we are communicating and the experiences that we're creating around that communication so that even as we communicate and speak our truths, we are creating experiences of awe. We are awakening the wonder of others. And there's a lot of things that we can do to enable that. Well, can you give some example? I mean, or have you seen that done? What are some techniques or, <laughs> um, you know, as a communicator, what would you, where would you suggest someone start if they were um, um, trying to awaken awe and wonder in other people? I mean, if they didn't have a bunny and hat um, <laughs> and, you know, smoke bombs sure. or whatever. Well, I mean, it all comes back to the power of story, right? And storytelling has kind of become a buzzword in recent years because everyone's obsessed with the neuroscience that's pretty common knowledge now about its ability to convert mindsets and belief systems and worldviews and sales and marketing. But story's greatest power is not in its ability to convert. It's in its ability to connect. And sometimes we just sort of skim over connection and jump straight to whatever conversion we're trying to get to take place. Right. The um, sale. Connection, yeah. that exchange of empathy is powerful. And so I think to slow down, and first of all, I would say that every communicator should view themselves as a storyteller first. Someone sent me, I can't remember the name of it or the author, but someone sent me a book a couple years ago. Um, they asked me to endorse it. And it was basically, it was, it was a guide for communication in churches, uh, just ministry context. And storytelling was one of the categories in the book. So it listed off like, here are the things that you need to get great at as a communicator. You need to be great at storytelling. You got to be great at video, like producing videos. You have to be great at social media. And these are separate categories. And what did I want to be is it's like, oh no, like you guys have missed it. All of your videos that you play, that is storytelling. Your social media is storytelling. Storytelling is not a category of communication. All communication is storytelling. And because, again, I keep coming back to this, if we as human beings are storytelling creatures, if the narratives that we adopt is true is what's driving all of our thinking and behavior, that means even if you don't feel like you are intentionally telling a story or trying to tell a story, if your communication is bad, well, 
storytelling is still happening because the person that you're communicating to is still taking all of the stuff that you're giving them and turning it into a story to try to make sense of it because that's how their brain works. So you can't not tell stories. Stories do not equal once upon a time and then this happened and then this happened. That is compelling storytelling and our stories can get more effective with better structure. But you can walk into a room or a museum and never say a word and no other human being ever says a word to you, but you still have an experience because the spaces that you're in tell you a story because you are taking what you're experiencing and what your senses are perceiving and you are turning it into a story to make sense of it all. And so I think a lot of communicators just mm-hmm. don't have this foundational knowledge or this true buy-in of the fact that they are a storyteller first and that everything is story. And then beyond that, story equals change. And so to understand the power that storytelling has when combined with wonder can be really transformational. Okay. So I, we can't leave the conversation without acknowledging the story of 2020, <laughs> like the wild, like, sure. like awe and wonder more like shock and awe or something, you know, just like <laughs> we've all been surprised, but not, not a good surprise this year. Probably, well, for the most part, you know, it's been a weird year. Uh, no doubt. so, uh, what do we do with this dream versus reality? You know, the wonder versus the, the sure. we- the weariness, uh, anxiety, uh, you know, fear, division, sure. all this stuff, you know, speak to that with what, what does wonder look like in this weird sure. moment, this cultural moment? Yeah. Great question. Um, how does it help us? <laughs> Yeah. And how do so we even find it? It all man. comes back to all the wonder switch toggles how we use our imagination. So imagination, the common myth is that it's something that we used a lot when we were kids. And then as we grow up, our imaginations become less active. And that's not the case. So imagination is just the, it is the flight simulator. It is the virtual reality tool. It is the thing that God gave you to answer a question. And that is what happens next in this story. And that can be as simple as I'm riding down the road in a car and the driver's not driving very well and my imagination goes to work and it pictures me ending up in a ditch somewhere. And that imagination, you know, of how this story ends sends a signal to my nervous system. My nervous system freaks out to keep me safe and says, hey, this isn't a safe car for you to be in. This person is driving recklessly. So our imagination is a gift, but that is still imagination. So the question is not, are you using your imagination? It's simply how are you using it? And so worry and anxiety is a misuse of imagination. And it takes the same amount of creative energy to fill in the blank what happens next with something beautiful and optimistic and hopeful. And wonder gets us through that gap from the old story to the new story. So let me start with that. Second, there's this thing called liminal space. People are starting to talk about it more often. Last year at the conference that I run called Story, Story 2019, our theme was between no longer and not yet. And it was all about the liminal space. When we, when we feel like we're going out of something old and we're stepping into something new, but the old thing feels like it's still hanging around. It's not really gone yet. The new story feels like it hasn't been fully realized. And so we're sort of caught in the in-between, right? In the creative process, we often call it the messy middle, but it's the liminal space. Cultural anthropologists call liminal space the space of no story. So if you have an old story and a new story, but you stepped out of the old story voluntarily, or in the case of 2020, we got yanked out of the old story against our will, kicking and screaming, right? <laughs> none of us none of us volunteered to step out of the story. We got ripped out of it. Well, the new story hasn't really been realized yet. It hasn't come to life. And so we're in this space, this uncomfortable in between, in between where it is mysterious. If there's no story and we're storytelling creatures, well, then naturally it feels uncomfortable. We feel untethered, like we're floating through space, like we're not anchored in a narrative. And so imagination and how we use it is important. But if the wonder switch toggles how we use our imagination, we need wonder now more than ever before because wonder is what gives us the fuel to push through the liminal space, to push through the messy middle. Because again, wonder compounded by hope, it gives us permission to believe that that new story is possible. And the possibility of that new story is what keeps us going through the difficult times. So I say stop using your imagination to worry. Instead, reawaken your wonder and permit your imagination to dream, create, and innovate. And that will serve as a powerful tool to help you navigate change. 
I mean, I think that that's a great summary right there. I, I won't go too much farther with you because I see we're coming to the end of our time, but but I, I, I feel challenged personally. I feel more curious even just in this talk with you. So um, in this weird liminal space, if people <laughs> want to connect with you, um, are you, or maybe you can say too, like uh, we're talking about the Wonder Switch, your book, uh, releasing October 13th, 2020. Uh, but uh, how else could people get your content? I mean, like, can people hire you? Are you traveling? Are you doing <laughs> online shows? What tell, yeah. tell us how we can get yeah. more of you. Uh, in certain parts of the world, there are physical events that are starting to come back. I've been speaking at, I've been doing lots of virtual keynotes and workshops and lunch and learns with teams. Um, I, we have a conference called Story uh, that typically sells out each year. This year we were virtual. That just finished. But storygatherings.com, you can learn more about this amazing community of storytellers. And that is everyone from artists and communicators to marketers, advertisers, anyone who does any form of creating. We believe that everyone is a storyteller, but yeah, start with the book. It's called the wonder switch. As you said, you can learn more at the wonder My website is Harris, the third.com. So just Harris, I, I, I like the Roman numeral three. Uh, and I respond to all my DMS on socials. Uh, so send me a message on Instagram. Do you? That's really the- good. I'm glad you do that. I yeah. tell people in social media consulting stuff all the time, you have to do, if you're going to be there, you have to engage with people. I'm glad you replied. It's a lot of work, but I'm glad you do it. <laughs> it is a lot of work. It doesn't always happen in real time, like instantaneously. Sure, so sure. even if it takes a day or two, I do always get back to those. So yeah. Awesome. Harris the third. I, uh, I really enjoyed talking to you today. Thank you so much for your time. And I want to, of course, show notes are show notes are going to link to all the places that we can find you and your book and uh, I think you'd be an amazing addition to, to, you know, conference lineups uh, and, um, you know, just staff training as we're learning to be better communicators in this new liminal space. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Thank you, Joanna. It's a pleasure to be on the podcast. Um, thank you for all that you do for communicators and storytellers around the world. We need the work that you're doing to keep our wonder alive and keep us keep us going and making us better communicators. So thank you.